Effectively, the tax saving can be $20,000 a year in tax if you choose to distribute half of your income from the business to the no income earning spouse. Absolutely every single investor should know about trusts in Australia. Now I'm not talking about offshore trusts, trust fund babies, or the black pool of nominee trusts. Effectively, I'm talking about the absolutely legal, normal Australian trusts, whether it be a unit trust, discretionary trust, a family trust, or all the other trusts which I'm gonna talk about. Your ears should prick up when you hear the words asset protection, tax planning, delegation, and privacy because if you're planning to get financially free, you need to understand the basics now to set yourself up for future decisions. In this practical video, I'm gonna cover off on some cool, that's right, cool things which trusts can do to drop your tax, boost your asset protection, and set your structures up right to maximize future opportunities. So let's get into trusts. This is the most important part of the video, and as I always state, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a financial planner, and this is not any form of financial advice. If you need advice around trusts, you should speak to one of the three people I have just mentioned. And by going past this point in the video, you agree to be bound by the disclaimer, which has been linked in the video's description. What is a trust? Well, effectively a trust is a legal agreement known as a trust deed, where one person, the trustee, holds assets for another person, the beneficiary. A practical example of this is say, for example, I meet you, so hello you, and I have some shares. And effectively, we enter into a legal agreement called a trust deed. I send you those shares as a trustee. So effectively, you now own those shares in your name, but the legal agreement still states that whatever you derive from, or effectively them, they are still mine. So anytime those shares pay dividends, you pay that back to me. And anytime you sell those shares and realize the cash, you then choose to pay that back to me. This little example shows off some scenarios which is important to consider around trusts. First things first is the tax liability. Effectively, those dividends and when you sell those shares, that is not your tax liability. That's effectively mine because you've just sent the money back to me. I still have to pay tax. The other thing is, is legal liability. So for example, if you get sued, those assets aren't actually yours. I have a legal agreement. They are still my assets. So if someone sues you, they can't take those assets. The other thing is, is if someone sues me, effectively you hold those assets. So you cannot be compelled to sell those assets and pay that to the person which is suing me. And the final thing is, is on any registers of those shares, effectively it shows your name and not mine, even though I effectively own those assets. These simple concepts create those four core components of why trusts in Australia are so important. Effectively, it creates a form of asset protection. It allows for tax planning. It also means that I have privacy. And finally, it allows me to delegate the responsibility of the day-to-day -day operations to you. With trusts, it's also worthwhile mentioning tax. Now, trusts are a little bit different to a company or a person. Effectively, trusts aren't taxed, what happens is the income or capital gains from a trust is distributed to a beneficiary and the tax is then paid in that respective person's name. So this can be handy with tax planning because effectively you can then choose where and who is paying your tax. There are a few key roles within every trust. The first role is the trustee and in this scenario this is you and effectively that is the person which holds the assets on the benefit to other people. This can be a natural person and it can also be a company. The most important person in every trust is the appointor and in this scenario, this would more than likely be me. Effectively, this gives me the right to change the trustee. So if I don't like what you're doing, I can change it to another trustee. An appointer can also be a company, so this creates some further flexibility. The next key person is the beneficiary. This effectively is a person, persons, or a company, which the trustee has to, or at their discretion can, pay the proceeds of the shares or the dividends too. The final person is a settler and it's a bit of an archaic role. Effectively, it's the person who gives the initial payment into the trust to set it up, but for the remainder operational reasons of the trust, they can walk away and they do not need to do anything. Starting with the trustee, their role is to effectively interpret the trustee's rules and regulations and execute the day-to-day -day operations to the benefit of the beneficiaries. The other thing which the trustee must do is subscribe to my 
channel because by subscribing to my channel, this would make you a better trustee. Now, you would notice that all the roles that I've talked about can be a company. So what is the point of using a company for these roles? The first thing is, is if it's a company that just is the trustee of the trust, you can quite easily identify all of the assets to that trust by simply looking up the company's name. If you need to change the natural person that's acting as a trustee, in a traditional scenario, you would need to transfer all the assets into the new trustee's name. Whereas if that natural person is a director of the trustee company and they resign and change to another person, effectively this can be done without changing all the assets from person A to person B. The other reason is the appointor or person in control can effectively be the shareholder of the company and still not director of the company. This would give them extra control on ensuring that the director of the trustee company does exactly what the appointer is looking for them to do. And finally, there is further asset protection and limited liability reasons of using a company as trustee of a trust. So how do you set up a trust? Well, the first thing that happens is the settler comes along and they speak to a solicitor who drafts up a trust deed. The settler then selects a trustee and if it's a company trustee, they might form the company before they execute the trust. The settler then with the trust deed and the trustee gives money into the trust to form the trust deed. Once a trust deed is executed and the trust becomes live, effectively you can now set up bank accounts for the trust and the trustee also then starts the bookkeeping process for the trust. There are a range of different trusts in Australia and they have some advantages and disadvantages. I have a list of trusts in front of me because it's quite long. There's a unit trust, a discretionary or family trust, it's the same thing. There is a fixed trust, there is a self-managed super fund, there is a testamentary trust, there is a bear trust, there's a hybrid trust and there is a charitable trust. And finally, there is a YouTube subscriber trust and effectively the YouTube subscriber trust is a trust where you subscribe to me because you trust me. That was a tongue twister so you should subscribe because I'm really trying to get you to subscribe to my channel. The first type of trust I'm going to talk about is a unit trust and what makes this one unique is effectively the proportion of the assets within the trust you own is dictated by the amount of units which you own in the trust. So for example, if the trust has 100 units and you own 30 of those, effectively you own 30% of the assets within the trust. So when the trust distributes income or distributes assets, you will receive approximately or you will receive exactly 30% of those assets. Now, a little tip worth mentioning is if you're planning to set up a unit trust like this, think about what is the most divisible number. It is not 100. What I like to do is set up my trust with 120 units because this is a lot more divisible than 100. Or the other option is if you have a fixed investment which is going into that and you need to raise money to purchase that investment, you issue $1 per unit and then for every dollar you put into the trust, you effectively own one unit of that trust. The next trust is a discretionary or family trust and what makes this different to a unit trust is rather than a fixed entitlement, the trustee at their discretion can effectively distribute the income or cash from the trust to a person which they nominate. The next trust is a self-managed super fund. So effectively, if you have a super fund and decide to manage it yourself, you set it up as a trust and that's pretty much as much detail as I'm gonna get into that for this video. A testamentary trust is effectively a trust that forms on the death of somebody. Effectively, it's used for estate planning. For example, if you have children and they are not at an age that they can manage assets, you on your death may transfer those assets to a trust rather than directly to the children and someone may control that assets on your behalf. A bear trust is where there's a single trustee and single beneficiary and the trustee has control over the beneficiary. This type of trust is commonly used when lending in a self-managed super fund. The next one is a hybrid trust. It's similar to a unit trust in the sense that the trustee can determine who the distributions go to, but it's a little bit different in the sense that there's separate or different units within the trust. So this allows the trustee to distribute income to one person and capital gains to another person. Person. The purpose for this is the tax environment for capital gains is different to income. Now this is probably one of those structures that is not about tax planning when you talk to the ATO, but it's probably it's probably for tax planning purposes. As the name suggests, a charitable trust is for philanthropic endeavors. The final one is a fixed trust, and this is similar to a unit trust in the sense that you have a fixed proportion of any distributions from the trust, 
but it's a little bit different to a unit trust because a unit trust determines the entitlement based on units where a fixed trust just says you have 30%. So it's just a different way of chopping up the distributions. So what is the advantages of trust for everyday Australians? Well, there are a few and I'm gonna give you some practical examples. So first one is say I was gonna go buy a commercial building and that commercial building produces income and I'm gonna put some cash into that trust in order to afford the deposit for the building. What might happen because it's a trust and it's separate to me, the bank will only look through to the assets and income of the property itself. And because it's a separate legal entity, if something goes wrong with that commercial investment, it will not come back to me at a personal capacity because it's solely quarantined within that trust. The other advantage is unlike a company where I'd be taxed at a full capital gains tax rate, within the trust on sale, that money is then comes back to me and effectively I'm only taxed at my marginal tax rate, which might mean I get a capital gains tax benefit. The next is litigation in my personal capacity. So say for example, I hold all my assets in a family trust and I'm sued and I lose and effectively that person can claim against all my assets. Well, first things first, they can't claim against the family trust assets because they're not held by me. The second thing is, is they might be able to claim against my income I receive from that trust, but remembering the trustee has the discretion to not pay me an income until I settle that claim. So by setting up a family trust and getting sued and losing, effectively it reduces any financial losses against a, a successful litigation claim against me. The next is divorce of a child with a testamentary trust. Say you're a parent and you have assets and effectively you want to protect those assets for your bloodline, a testamentary trust may stop a spouse that is divorcing one of your kids from obtaining your assets. The next one is tax planning through a discretionary trust. Say for example you're a high income earner with the savings that you're getting, you're investing and you're investing them through a family trust. That family trust is making returns. The, with those returns, you then pay that back to your lower income earning spouse and effectively, this means that you won't be paying tax in your marginal tax rate, you'll be paying tax in your spouse's marginal tax rate. As a small business owner, a discretionary trust can be handy because you can distribute income from your business to a lower income earning spouse. This is not big business, this can be say a small tradie business that's making 150 to $200,000 a year with a stay at home mother. Effectively, the tax saving can be $20,000 a year in tax if you choose to distribute half of your income from from the business to the no income earning spouse. Trust can be used in joint ventures where, for example, if I was buying commercial property or I was buying a property development deal and I only wanted 50% of the deal, I could effectively buy 50 of 100 units in a trust and my business partner could buy the other 50 or 100 units. This is a strong way to protect your interests but also reduce the amount of exposure to any one deal. As I've alluded to before, estate planning can be handy with a trust because on the death of a person, effectively the assets don't necessarily have to transfer. They can stay within the trust and effectively the trust trustee takes over control of running those assets. I feel like another useful thing which a trust can do is subscribe to my channel. So when you set up your trust, set up a YouTube account for your trust and subscribe to my channel because having two subscribers to my channel is better than one. There are some disadvantages of a trust which are worth mentioning and the first one is losses. So for example, if you make an investment and you have a capital loss, that loss is trapped within the trust, meaning that you cannot get that tax deduction against a capital gain unless you have have another asset within that trust that has a capital gain. Almost all states in Australia have a maximum vesting date for a trust of 80 years, meaning that if your trust gets over 80 years, you will need to transfer the assets out of trust into the beneficiary's names and there may be tax implications. The final thing is extra book work because effectively the assets are held separate to the trustee and separate to the beneficiary, so you just need to make sure you are accounting for the trust separately. So now you know the basics of the trust, practical things that you can do with a trust, and some of the disadvantages of holding a trust. So until you set up your next trust, not before you've got advice, but when you set up your next trust or until my next video, best of luck and goodbye.